Yes, please do. Thank you. Oh, this is scary. Um, so if a patient does test negative, it looks like there's still maybe a 2% very low false negative rate. Would that same patient test negative again, or is it just sort of random inaccuracy? Is this on? No. Um, it's on? OK. Uh, really good question that we don't know the answer to. <laughs> but a lot more testing will be required in this ongoing. I mean, it's rapidly expanding the, the testing that, that would allow that sort of uh, discrimination to be made. But it's a really important point. Yes, please. Another really good question. I'm not. Um, I'm not a clinician, so I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. But Jiri Safar uh, probably be, or be good to answer it. We started reporting the RT quick results uh, April 15th, and uh, we sent a letter to all uh, major associations, neuropathologists, and neurologists. Uh, to let them know that the test is available for reporting back to them and to the families, April 15th. So we have tested already under this regime 704 samples of CSN. Down the front here, please. C just while we're getting the microphone, can I uh, ask you a question which I think is very interesting, I hope, to this audience, and that is that in many of these experiments, for example, Glenn, you show this incubation period and variations depending upon different strains, etc. Can you tell us what's happening during the incubation period? And particularly if you've got these models with okay, uh, GSS models, what is actually happening? Why is there a delay? Yeah. All of these questions are really good. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So th this goes back to the description of these um, agents as, as slow viruses, unconventional slow viruses. The, um, we don't know too much about the, uh, the mechanism of conversion and, and how this occurs or, or where it occurs. I think that's still safe to say. Um, but the, uh, the long kinetics of disease uh, would be uh, consistent with um, a, a pretty a, a slow conversion and uh, uh, reaching a particular threshold of infectivity in the brain. And, and obviously, I think also another important point is that the prions need to affect particular regions of the brain in order for us to get our readout, in other words, the, the clinical signs. Uh, so dissemination of the infectious agent from the point of inoculation to uh, critical regions in the brain w would obviously also be another factor. In terms of strains, uh, in the absence of nucleic acids, how can strains encode, how can different biological properties be encoded uh, by strains? Well, what we, what we believe to be true and the working hypothesis that I think most people in the field are, are, are using is that there are subtly different conformational um, differences um, the di uh, different shapes of the molecule, the PRP scraping molecule, that correspond to differences in the strain properties. Um, and that there's pretty good evidence that, that that's the case. The actual mechanism of how these strains impart different uh, biological properties to the prions, though, is still unknown. I think that's safe to say. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. not as infected because most of the protein goes the other way. D does that imply then that maybe there might be GI spread of the disease out the gut? Uh, possible. I mean, it's been found in some cases in variant CJD that it's present in 
urine at least and, and certainly animal models have been uh, found in feces, uh, whether the extent to which that's true for human CJD cases is unclear, but yeah, there, there definitely can be. Okay, I thought it was working. Um, okay, so anyway, the answer is yes, and certainly in, in variant CJD cases, there's shedding of these prions or the seeding activity into the urine as shown by other laboratories. And, um, and, and in animal models, it can be shed into feces at least as well, so there can be some sort of GI shedding, whether it uh, represents a practical problem uh, and an you know, important part of a transmission cycle in, in the real world in humans is another question, but there's a, possible, a possibility that should be entertained. Glenn? I, I have a question for Thomas, actually, and, and some comments. I think, I think the work that you show um, the vaccination <clears throat> work uh, of uh, what is actually a highly infectious disease in the natural host is extremely promising, right? So you've got, and these are highly preliminary studies, and uh, in one case you ha had uh, an animal that was, that was cured of, of the disease. So can you, can you talk about um, how, how these studies might be moving forward and how they might be applied to the, the human situation? Um. So, uh, th but we're very excited about uh, the, these preliminary results, and, and certainly uh, for infectious prion disease, th th this would be a, a potential uh, highly effective means of preventing th their spread. Uh, it, th there is some uh, also potential for using them in, in uh, human diseases to prolong the incubation period where perhaps the replication of the, the prion agent could be inhibited uh, by the, this immune response. And uh, th th this is uh, uh, experiments w which are uh, hopefully w will be ongoing with the use of s some of uh, Glenn's uh, uh, models uh, to test whether that indeed will, will be the case. So th these um, immunological approaches are now in clinical trial in Alzheimer's disease in a variety of settings, and we're hoping that uh, the recognition that, they, that these Im immune modulations have promise uh, for prion disease will, uh, will advance uh, th this approach and lead to uh, future clinical trials of uh, 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 testing this approach. Uh, uh, in humans for prion infection. Yes, please. Just one minute. Just wait. We want to use the microphone. Okay. Uh, during the incubation uh, phase, can one experience benign symptoms like um, temper? Uh, insomnia before the acute phase of CJD? Uh, so uh, certainly there, there can be a variety of very early uh, symptoms right. b b before the, the more obvious neurological uh, 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 symptoms emerge. Right. And, and that can be very diverse, the depression, uh, exactly. behavioral change, and then uh, the, the more obvious neurological symptoms become manifest. Manifest itself. Uh, and it, the, the incubation period for some uh, of the, the prion diseases, for example, for Kuru, have been documented to potentially be longer than 60 years. So the, 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 in human disease, prion uh, uh, pre-symptomatic, yeah. Can, can have a very long incubation period. Can, yeah. And the, the, the promising thing about that is that in that period without clinical symptoms, it's likely that these therapeutic approaches that we're, we're considering would have the greatest effect. So the, the methods like the RT-QUIC, where very early detection is possible, combined with these emerging therapeutic approaches, together hold a great deal of promise where we might be able to make an early diagnosis 
before very significant neurological uh, deficits and give a, a, a treatment that, that might be effective. Right, okay. Can, can I ask you a question, Thomas, because it's very encouraging, the, the immune approach, but we know that the tertiary or the quaternary structure of all these proteins vary in, in, in CJD and also different mutations. If you were going to do an immune therapy, would you have to have bespoke therapy for individual types of CJD or types of familial disease, or would there be a generic approach like Alzheimer's disease? So, a, a, a great question. <laughs> so, uh, unknown. My, my own guess is that uh, th th it would require some specificity, but uh, in terms of the immunomodulation with active immunization, yeah. you can uh, target multiple pathological species concurrently. If yeah. one wants to do it uh, via passive immunization, you would have to give multiple antibodies at the same time just one monoclonal in this setting wouldn't work because of, of the, the, the problem that, and the emergence of resistant species. So it, it, it would be a, a com complicated okay. but possible thing to do. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. So loud. Okay. Um, I also have a question for Dr. Wisniewski. Um, uh, you showed some very encouraging results regarding vaccination against chronic wasting disease and other forms of prion disease in mice. A really important difference between those models and CJD is that in chronic wasting disease, the prions are acquired orally. The deer eat something and they get prions into their gut, and from there it travels to their blood, their spleen, then their peripheral nerves, and then their brain. So there's sort of a lot of opportunities there for the immune system to intercept the prions before they reach the brain. Um, whereas in, you know, sporadic and genetic CJD and FFI and so on, there's little evidence that there is any infectivity outside of the brain. Um, and so I, I wonder if you've done any experiments to test whether your approach has any efficacy in situations where the infection begins in the brain or is already established in the brain. Um, so uh, those sorts of experiments are ongoing, but um, if one takes the, the analogy for Alzheimer's disease, the prion-like spread of that pathology is all within the brain. And the, the, these immunological approaches do show a, a, a great deal of benefit in that setting. So from a, a, a theoretical standpoint, one would expect that it is possible to uh, use this approach for prion disease that are uh, where the spread is only in the CNS. The, 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 the caveat here would be that it would be much more important than to specifically target the pathological uh, conformers only without any potential for uh, attacking the normal form of the prion uh, protein because that would likely be associated with a good deal of toxicity in the brain. But uh, so uh, I, I'm hopeful that this approach would also be effective in those settings. Okay. Ruthie, um, just while we're waiting for the microphone, <clears throat> can, I, can I ask Glenn a question? Uh, and it's probably a rather a, a controversial question. You showed this very interesting evidence that CWD is spreading throughout the United States and that muscle contains potential infectivity. Right. Do you think enough has been done in the United States to protect the general public against chronic wasting disease? I'm sorry if it's a rather controversial question, but I thought I'd just put you on the spot. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, until, the, until the sky is falling, you know, um, it, it's very difficult to, uh, to kind of alert, alert people and authorities to... Um, to uh, the potential of these things, and, and you saw that in the UK, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know, Larry, uh, I, I, there is uh, involvement <laughs> for, by uh, the, the, the CDC. I mean, they're looking actively at this, and they're, they're looking in collaboration with people in Colorado, the endemic area, uh, for the occurrence of um, unusual cases that might be associated with exposure to CWD, for, in particular hunters. Um, I think at this stage, um, that's pretty much all we can do, you know. Um. Okay. 
Well, we've got Dr. Schoenberger here from yeah. CDC who's going to answer <laughs> the question directly. I can yeah. tell you that um, in areas where chronic wasting disease exists, right. the state health departments and others give hunters the information that they should avoid the cons consumption of deer that are ill or look sick and, and there's also um, on specific websites there are techniques advertised for how to um, clean the animal and to prepare the animal for consumption and so on. So there are these preventative measures that are being recommended but I can also tell you that hunters as a group tend to be a little bit laissez-faire about this type of thing and may not uh, um, take advantage of that. At the same time, they ask us whether we've seen any disease, and the answer is no. And we, to, to look for those types of transmissions, we have some ongoing studies in Wyoming and in Colorado where the disease has been there the longest, so you had the longest chance for incubation periods to have occurred. Neither of those states have an increased incidence of what doctors can recognize as prion disease. Now that assumes, of course, that if CWD did spread to humans, it would be recognized by physicians as a prion disease or something like CJD. We also have ongoing, and maybe if Ermius is here and Ryan and so on, there is a study that they might want to tell us a little bit about where we uh, take hunter licenses and correlate that with CDC's death index. And we look to see if there's any connections and whether there is a greater number of deaths due to CJD among those that we know had bought licenses to hunt in various areas. And the answer so far is no. Okay. And uh, so that's pretty uh, reassuring. However, as somebody talked here, what, a 60-year incubation period or something like that, then you've got a, a potential problem. Could it happen later? And so we're continuing to monitor that. Let me comment while I've got the phone, uh, the microphone, <laughs> about a, a previous statement uh, where infectivity was identified, say, in the urine of a variant CJD case, and infectivity. And I think, Will, you have a, a ability to tell people, I mean, epidemiologically, do you see any kind of evidence in the epidemic in the UK of urine transmitting to other individuals within the United Kingdom. In other words, is there person-to-person -person type spread going on? And, I, and my understanding from your previous report is the answer is no. Is that, is that fair? I don't know if you're allowed to ask me a question. I'm the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. I think there's a, there's a, the answer to the question is no. There's no evidence of lateral transmission right. of these diseases at all anywhere in any form. But the big problem is that the more sensitive tests you develop, like PMCA and RT-Quick, right. you sometimes identify something in a human fluid with a highly sensitive test that amplifies it a billion fold. Yes. But you don't know what that actually means in terms of risk. And exactly. you need epidemiology to do that. As far as I'm concerned, we have no evidence of transmission, either through nasal excretions or urine or anything of that sort. I think that's quite important. Yeah. So I think that was an important point to make, that the tests have gotten to be so sensitive now. And in fact, that recent variant CJD case that uh, Dr. Fisher, or Michael, you may talk about, wasn't that initially diagnosed with a ur positive urine test? And uh, so it was there, but we still don't worry about the person-to-person -person transmission, although the possibility, since the infection is there, you got to keep it in the back of your mind, but it doesn't necessarily express itself. Okay, yes. We could. Uh, could you wait for the microphone, please? Um, coyotes, yeah. uh, wolves, bears eat yeah. deer. 
Are they infected? There's no evidence for that right now. And in terms, in terms of uh, canids, um, certainly this has been looked at in the UK in, uh, with BSC. That they appear to be a, a relatively, actually quite resistant they uh, are class resistant. of animals um, to all known pre infections so really? far. Why that is, Why? we're not entirely sure, but we think it's something to do with the um, specialness of the prion protein that's expressed in dogs. I Maybe see. it has some protective some aspects Some protective to it, aspect. Which in and of itself is interesting, and it may lead us to, to clues of how we might you know, engineer protective therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Kelling, um, could you comment on your uh, point about CWD can be infected by aerosol? By aerosol? Yeah, um, those experiments have been done uh, at the Prion Research Center in, in, in Colorado. So, uh, and those have been done not only in transgenic mouse models, but also in, um, in the natural host in deer. So it, it is a means of transmission. Whether that's the means of transmission in the wild, uh, I think is anyone's guess. So the other aspect of this that is worth commenting on is that these agents are shed into the environment. And uh, as we probably all know, these uh, prions are, uh, uh, are very difficult to inactivate. And so persistence of infectivity in the, in the environment um, from shedding in feces and urine and so on, and, and also probably animal to animal contact is, is probably a very important means of transmission. Um, the actual contribution of aerosolization or just uh, um, in, uh, incidental exposure is, is unclear right now, but it's certainly a means of transmission. Yes. We, we've heard a lot of comments about uh, chronic wasting disease. Just, this is just a thought. Is there a possibility that people have Hunters have consumed a contaminated animal and have not contracted CWD because there is some sort of immunity in the human body. Yeah, yeah. Um, immunity might, might, not, might, might not be the way to think about it, but it's all about whether or not the prion um, that causes uh, disease in deer or elk can cross this barrier into species and convert uh, not now the, the deer or the elk prion protein, the normal form, but the human prion protein. Experimental evidence for whether or not that's true is, is controversial. In some cases, uh, for example, um, studies in non-human primates suggest uh, that, that that might be possible, but other experiments in transgenic mouse models and they may, you know, we could argue about how perfect those models are, suggest that it, if it does occur, it's, it's a very infrequent uh, process. Um, so right now, that's all I can say, but uh, I would, you know, I would err on the side of precaution, you know, use the precautionary principle, because we know that these diseases are zoonotic. Certainly, that's the case, you know, with BSC. So um, right now, we don't know too much about that. Uh, potential in, in the case of CWD. Question so, so to oh, yeah. e echo those comments for CWD, it, it's well known that the deer material is infectious pre-symptomatically. So the preventative measures for telling hunters not to eat a sick looking deer, obviously that's true, but there is also a preclinical period in the deer where the deer are infectious. And it's likely that thousands of North Americans are being exposed. So this is a very low probability event that transmission will take place. But a low probability event will likely happen uh, since a large number of people are being exposed. So I, I think we're living through the UK experience in North America now. The, the other thing to remember, this is a, a, a new disease, right, in, in, in terms of prion diseases. This is a disease that's only been recognized for a few decades and, and is rapidly emerging. It's highly contagious 
And uh, I, I think Thomas's uh, comments are well taken. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I had a question about the immuno immunotherapeutic approaches. Does that tell us anything, uh, and probably not, but just out of interest, as to why some people are more susceptible, you know, why sporadic occurs in some people, why some people could be exposed atrogenically and get it and some wouldn't? Is there anything about your studies that would um, bear on that? Um, so, uh, because the, the prion protein is a self protein, uh, the, in the natural disease, there isn't much of an immune response. Right. And in fact, the, the, the immune system can be part of the replication process. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, the, there is some evidence that a, a certain percentage of older individuals who have antibodies to the more pathological species of A beta or tau have some protection. That, that's the, the evidence there is a little bit unclear. Uh, in, in prion disease, it, it typically probably doesn't play a, a big role be, because of this issue that the prion protein is a self uh, protein and the immune system doesn't recognize it very much. So that with, with the immunomodulatory approaches, one is looking to overcome that tolerance and to, to get an immune response more specific to the pathological forms. And then I have kind of a related, it's not exactly related, but so, you know, thinking futuristically, if you were able to detect it early, right, and you talk about maybe, you know, I remember with my husband and lots of other people talk about symptoms occurring three years, four years before, but they're very subtle symptoms, so I'm trying to figure out other than in the familial case where I can see how you could detect it early and then you could immunize, right? But logistically, you're talking about not that many cases in a very huge population. How could you imagine logistically that that would occur that you would So, so the, the, well, the, the way I envisage it is uh, perhaps what Byron was speaking about, that these RT quick uh, right. uh, methods <clears throat> can be applied to many pathological conformers. So uh, I think we're, we're hopefully in the relatively near future, there's going to be pre-symptomatic tests for all the neurodegenerative disorders. So when one turns 50, you go in for a test to see if you're pre-symptomatic for AD, for Parkinson's disease, and prion disease, and then if these uh, preventative therapies will become available, they will be initiated at that point. So uh, uh, that, that, that's what I'm uh, suggesting might be the future of medicine. We'll, we'll see. Yes, Byron. Byron. So uh, to, to add to the issue of you know, what might influence whether individuals, certain individuals are prone to these diseases and others not, perhaps. I think it's important to keep in mind that in addition to, say, the active immune surveillance that Thomas is talking about, um, there are also quite exquisitely effective protein quality control mechanisms in, in our bodies that tend to keep these protein misfolding processes in check. And um, I think it's, we don't, certainly don't know the whole story about how these protein quality control mechanisms work and, and what might influence their effectiveness, but it does seem pretty clear that with aging, for instance, and probably to a different extent between individuals, these protein quality control mechanisms that do have some capacity to break down prions probably, but also the misfolded protein aggregates associated with all these other neurodegenerative diseases, um, you know, will have different capacities uh, between individuals, so it might make some people uh, more susceptible than others. And, you know, you can clearly overwhelm that system, especially in experimental a animals, by inoculating large amounts of the, of the seeds. and everything spirals out of control, but when you're talking about spontaneous disease that typically arises in the case of sporadic CJD in the 60s or so, um, 
you know, there's, you got to ask why doesn't it happen earlier, you know, and, and more people, and it probably has to do with age-related um, compromising of these protein quality control mechanisms. Thank you. Brian? Hi, Thomas. Nice to talk. I have two related questions. One is um, some of the family members may be aware in the last year or two, a lot of the immunological approaches to Alzheimer's disease when translated clinically have not been that successful. Um, so that's a concern. And one of the great theories behind that is just not giving early enough. So the first question is how do you see immunological approaches to things like sporadic CJD where we really diagnose the illness late in the game? And then the second one kind of relates to Eric's question, and that is, do you see anything about prion disease that may make it an immunological approach more successful than what we've seen in Alzheimer's disease clinically thus far? So uh, uh, th these uh, immunological approaches for Alzheimer's disease are in the early days, and uh, I think it's not surprising that the early attempts have not been that successful. And the issue there is the specific, what species out of the multiple possibilities are the critical ones to target. And the, the approaches are showing much more promise now. Uh, and I think on the prion side, we can take these lessons from the Alzheimer's field and translate them. And I, I think that the, the, there, there is a great deal of promise of the specific targeting of pathological prion conformers and, and using that to inhibit replication. But it does have to be coupled with early detection. Okay. Um, one, I think it's, we're near the end now. I just got one final question. Uh, one of the confusing things about this to medical students when you try and teach them about these diseases is we've all got a prion protein gene. All mammalian species have a prion protein gene. It must be important. So the simple question is, what does it do? Simple question? <laughs> because it's very important for treatment, because one approach to treatment is to switch off prion protein production. And you need to know what it does normally in order to justify doing that. So does anyone have an answer? Because I think it's an important question. So, so in terms of mouse models, um, we, we have the ability to eliminate the expression of, of genes at will, and this has been done. This is actually the, the prion protein was one of the early so-called knockout mouse models. And, uh, you know, as, as Bob, you know, indicated, this is a, a highly conserved protein. It's highly expressed in the central nervous system. Um, it's conserved across devolution. It, it must have some function. When the protein was knocked out in mice, the mice were fine. Uh, no obvious um, deficits were recorded, except these mice were now unable to be infected with prions, and, and this substantiated the, the prion hypothesis that you need the, the normal prion protein to be converted. Cattle have actually also been um, produced that have knocked out, and they appear to be also um, fine. Um, there's a controversy in the field right now as to you know, whether these immunologic approaches that target the prion protein will be toxic. And, and, and depending on who you talk to, um, various groups have said there's no problem. Uh, you know, um, it, it doesn't matter if you treat with large amounts of antibody, it's not going to be toxic. And other groups do, do not agree with that. So uh, I think the, um, it's an open question right now. But, um, a whole host of functions have been associated w with the prion protein, uh, ranging from uh, the control of uh, sleep, um, uh, electrophysiological um, uh, dysfunction in the brain, um, what else, myelination, um, and it, it, it's, it's become a, come a, a kind of a cottage industry, you know, to, to look for different phenotypes in these mice, but it really hasn't helped us uh, discern the normal function. I'd just like to add, though, that, I mean, when, when the prion protein gene was knocked out of mice, and, and, and Glenn says, and the mice were fine, well, th those are laboratory mice in a laboratory cage with food and water right in front of them, all, you know, 24 hours a day. They're, they're not being put to the tests, the same sort of survival tests that they 
would be put to in, in the wild and in, in the same w with a domestic cow. So um, it must have some function and maybe those functions are really, presumably are important for survival in, in the wild even if they don't seem to affect the very much, very overtly the physiology of a, of, of a lab mouse. So, but bottom line is we don't really know what those functions are. I mean, maybe if you put, ask those mice to perform some, you know, mathematical calculations or whatever, or, or to escape from a cat, or to remember, um, uh, you, you know, remember where they stored food, that sort of thing, maybe you would see something. Um, but um, okay. it doesn't mean it, yeah, that it doesn't have a, an important function. Okay, my question is about um, the amyloid structure, the beta sheet structure. Um, so from what I understand, there's like close to two dozen different types of misfolded proteins and um, polypeptides, and they all relate to different diseases. And um, I know that we've talked a lot about Alzheimer's today, and um, I know that the, I guess, uh, protein associated with that is the beta amyloid, and the one associated with prion diseases is the PRPSC. So I was wondering, since there are other diseases, I think like cardiac arrhythmias and things like that that are associated with a different type of protein, are there any implications or things we can learn from things like that or type 2 diabetes or anything? Um, so you're quite right in pointing out that all of these different proteins share this high beta sheet content and have a lot of similarities in terms of their secondary structure. So I think Yes, there are uh, many lessons that can be applied to each of these diseases and uh, some of these therapeutic approaches will be applicable against this whole spectrum of conformational uh, d disorders, most of which are age-associated. So, well, I'd like to thank you all for all your questions and I'd particularly like to thank the, the three speakers for answering them so clearly.